Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Kirkpatrick. Welcome to the uh, Ask Me Anything. Uh, I will be your moderator today for a Ask Me Anything about Microsoft Compliance. We've got the whole stack in here, Information Protection and Governance, Insider Risk Management, Compliance Manager, um, Advanced e Discovery, Advanced Audit. So um, we are very excited to talk with everybody today. Um, please note uh, that uh, please use the chat function within here if you have any questions. Uh, we have a bunch of moderators here standing by, experts ready to really address your direct questions, so please ask them. Uh, depending on the volume of questions, we may not be able to get to everything. Uh, we generally try to get to as much as we can. Uh, if you see a question that you like, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Uh, and uh, please be aware that this is a um, this session can potentially be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please leave the session. Uh, but we'd much rather you stay. And uh, to help us be as efficient as possible, just please don't spam or add any sort of inappropriate comments. Um, and of course, uh, please adhere to the Microsoft Code of Conduct at all times. So let's go through and introduce our panel members. Uh, my name's Kevin Kirkpatrick. I work as a compliance readiness lead in building Microsoft learning paths. Um, we've got a great set of experts here today. Um, we'll start with Elliot. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm Elliot. I'm a program manager on the Microsoft Compliance Engineering team, um, and my primary focus is our new product compliance manager. Great. Matt? Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, Matt Studley. I'm a uh, advanced compliance global black belt, uh, so I work with customers to evaluate uh, the compliance stack and see if it's going to meet their needs. Great. Uh, Nur. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Neil Endler and I'm a program manager in the Microsoft Information Protection Customer Experience team. As part of my role, usually I work with large enterprise customers about adoption and deployment of Microsoft Information Protection solutions. Perfect. Uh, and Roberto. Hey everyone, Roberto Iglesias. I'm a product manager with the security and compliance team as well. And uh, I am part of the team that creates the information governance and records management solutions. Fantastic. So Roberto, um, we've got a great set of questions already coming in. Let's start with you. Uh, tell us about removing retention labels from SharePoint Online and OneDrive. Uh, where can I do this? Is it possible to uh, prevent people from removing labels, for example? Yeah. Great question to start with. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, three different types of, uh, let's say, of immutability within retention labels. Uh, a, re re a normal retention label is able to be modified and changed or even removed by anybody with contribute access to SharePoint and OneDrive. If you need a little bit more control, you can use a record label. A record label can only be changed to a different record label by those with contribute access, cannot be removed moved or changed to a non-record label by those with contribute access and can only be removed by those that are administrators in that location. Uh, and this uh, Ignite just yesterday, we also uh, announced the regulatory record label, which is aimed at even more strict scenarios. And so the regulatory record label, once applied on content, can never be removed. Uh, and it cannot also not be changed to any other classification. So it is more intended for those that have right ones, read many type requirements uh, with uh, advanced immutability. It will also block uh, the editing of metadata, moving uh, you know, outside of the container that it is in and on a lot more restrictions. So uh, that's how you can have the different levels of immutability depending on what you're trying to achieve. And we'll definitely uh, put a link in the announcements uh, that will have the link to our blog where you can check out more around the regulatory record label. In that blog, we have a link to a video that goes into detail about how to use it, the differences uh, between that one and a record label as well. Uh, next question I have is for Nur here. Um, Nur. Talk to me a little bit about what I can do with Microsoft Information Protection and encryption. Um, is there a way, for example, to tie when I'm doing encryption, is there a way I can actually uh, set this up 
so that members of a SharePoint site or team or document libs um, are the only ones that can see a file or what's what's really the best way to approach this? So thank you for that, Kevin. We do have a few integration at the moment with uh, SharePoint, uh, one based on the existing uh, um, content labels. That means that we leverage sensitivity labels as part of Microsoft Information Protection and we apply them to the content and the documents themselves that are stored inside the library. This uh, allows us, in addition to applying watermarking and applying uh, uh, protections with uh, in, uh, encryption, with rights management encryption, uh, uh, with that the ability to configure that the, the relevant audience that will be able to open this document. Now, this is something that has been done on the content level. We, in addition to that, we have something uh, that is a bit new that is called container labels, which take the same set of labels and allow to uh, um, to apply them on the uh, container itself it means that you have control about accessing the container for specific audiences and uh, this is based on uh, if the user is externally have specific rights if they uh, if there is an access for external users and what you can do with files inside the container and we have also for a few additional capabilities that are coming in related to that um, we are thinking about capabilities that will take these container labels and we will inherit these uh, container labels into the content of the labels, but this is something that is, doesn't exist yet uh, today. We are uh, uh, leveraging today auto labeling, which is uh, the new service based auto labeling capabilities, which can give you the, uh, the ability to configure auto labeling policies based on data that is already stored in SharePoint and label it based on the content. So there is no one to one uh, um, relationship between if the user is store, uh, the user that can access SharePoint versus if you will be able to access the document from a rights management perspective. But on the same time, uh, when you manage permissions for users to access the SharePoint library, then uh, you they this is means that they can also access these documents and you can apply the specific permissions to ensure that uh, these specific documents will be able to uh, access by the approved audience, even if they have access to the SharePoint site. Uh, library. So with that, you verify that data, sensitive data will not be leaked and will be accessed by the approved personnel for this one. That's great. Um, let's uh, let's rotate and let's talk a little bit about, I see a question in here I think will be great for Elliot here. Um, is there a roadmap for compliance templates to be added to compliance? Uh, I know in the past we've only had you know, we've had s several compliance templates, but it seems like maybe we're announcing some additional things. Uh, what could we talk about here for compliance manager and specifically here? We're, of course, um, we're in a great time zone right now for Australia. So let's talk about Australia, APRA, CPS 235. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so we don't have a published roadmap uh, in terms of the templates that we are planning to support, um, but we are certainly planning to add numerous additional compliance templates over time. Uh, with our launch of Compliance Manager yesterday, uh, we added an additional 160 compliance templates uh, to the solution. Uh, there are several Australia specific templates in there, um, and I can put a, a link in the chat that includes the, the full list of templates. Um, that specific template isn't supported today, although through the custom template functionality that we offer, uh, you can uh, add details of that template to your instance of Compliance Manager yourself. Um, but I do know that we are planning to add that specific regulation uh, to our template library in the near future. Great, thank you. Uh, near, um, talk, let's talk about container labels. A lot of people ask me this a lot. Uh, how does it work? Is there a way that I can apply a label to a container and really um, how uh, how would that affect things like inheriting documents? Does that, is that something that affects it today or, or how do we look at that? So as, as we just described, uh, container labels is something that um, is enabled on the container level and not on the on the on the file itself that is stored inside the container. And with that, you have a few controls that you can configure on accessing the container itself and permissions that you have when you access the container. Now, 
we this is something that is not just strict to SharePoint. This is something that is also available with uh, any Office 365 group. So it can be with the uh, Teams, uh, Teams groups, for example, with the uh, AAD Office 365 groups. You can label these groups, and they and, uh, as a container itself. So this is, is something that has been used both for um, uh, SharePoint sites and groups because they are all Office 365 groups eventually. Um, I do recommend to evaluate the capabilities that, that, that are available today. In addition to a new capability that we just announced this Ignite that will come in preview very soon to ensure that if you have a container that is labeled with the specific, uh, let's say confidential and you configure this uh, specific capability for container labels, then any documents that is stored in this container will inherit some DLP capabilities, like you are not able to share this externally, for example. So this is one of the things that you can do with container labels versus things that you can do with content labels, as we described earlier. Fantastic. Uh, question to Matt. Um, this one looks uh, a little more uh, related, I think, in the e-discovery space, uh, advanced e-discovery. Uh, so uh, we're currently using a third-party solution for archiving and uh, regulatory compliance. Um, how have you seen customers migrate to the Microsoft platform? Oh, thanks, Kevin. Um, so actually, I worked with a customer a little over a year ago uh, a customer in the banking industry, and they were using a third-party archiving solution. Um, and so what they ended up doing is they moved to uh, Office 365. They evaluated um, moving the content uh, out of that archive and taking advantage of some of the native capabilities. Um, and so they did that by turning on retention policies for the mailboxes. So they set, a, I believe it was a seven-year retention for all mail content. And then they worked with one of our partners to uh, actually migrate the older data out of their archiving solution into uh, the mailboxes. Um, and so they engaged a partner there because there was um, um, some um, custom development work that needed to be done to pull the data out of the existing solution and, and pipe it into um, into the mailboxes themselves. And then the other thing they evaluated was uh, communication compliance. Um, because they were in the, the, the banking environment, they had to um, uh, do supervision for their uh, broker dealers. Um, and with that, uh, they ran uh, basically communication compliance side by side um, with their uh, existing solution so that they could uh, go ahead and work through configuring the rules, um, uh, go ahead and update uh, the lexicons or the dictionaries they were using, and then train their uh, review personnel. Um, and when they had uh, gotten comfortable with that solution, they went ahead and turned off the, um, uh, the third party supervision tool. Oh, great. And you know what? Now that I just asked that, I think that's a little more with retention. It has nothing to do with it. We wouldn't normally call that e-discovery or anything like that. E-discovery, right, would be for uh, supporting our legal process and being able to uh, but still retain data or sometimes put a hold in a hold order. But yeah, a little, little bit different. Yeah, if, and if I can add to the response yeah, around that, uh, Kevin, um, uh, you know, in, in case somebody missed it, it's in the blog that I just shared. Yesterday we announced uh, 25, uh, the, we increased the number of data connectors to 25. And so you would be able to, if, if you're not just archiving data in a third party system because of data that's in 365, but maybe you have other systems like uh, your messaging solutions or some of the other ones that you're archiving in, in that um, now you have the capability of using our data connectors to bring that data in and get all the values. Uh, uh, Matthew was sharing. So check out that list and and check out your tenants where you can already see that. Perfect. Uh, Nur, here's a question I think that you might um, have a little bit to be able to talk about. Um, I know that you know Microsoft is makes obviously Microsoft Office and probably makes labeling work really well on that platform. Um, does this mean that if I uh, have PDF documents, I won't be able to uh, apply the same uh, things like sensitivity labels on on those same documents, or are we able to work with PDF documents as well? So I uh, ideally, um, as part of Microsoft Information Protection, we support multiple file types. Uh, PDF is one of them, um, but this is not a native, let's say, Microsoft file format. 
Uh, we do have the capabilities as part of the um, um, Azure Information Protection client in Windows to apply labels uh, for PDF files and uh, to use the same component to apply labels on other files. On Mac specifically, we have created the, the consumption part based on um, Edge browser which, that knows how to consume uh, protected PDFs uh, on a Mac. In addition, this is a, a file format that is usually owned by other uh, vendors that are working with Microsoft, like Adobe, for example. And the new file format for PDF was developed with Adobe and is part and is supported with the MIP SDK. And uh, Adobe as well integrated as part of Adobe Reader for Mac the ability to um, consume protected PDFs um, um, on on a Mac device. Uh, with that, um, because of this integration, uh, the applying the ability to apply label is not something that is currently developed by Microsoft, but it is something that we uh, hope to see from one of uh, the vendors that do have um, a specific engineering efforts on PDF file formats to introduce uh, in the future. Awesome. And uh, how about a follow up here, uh, Roberto? How about in terms of governance or um, retention? Um, how do we work from Microsoft? I know that um, we work really well across for Microsoft 365. Uh, can we do these same capabilities in other platforms that are maybe not within Microsoft? Yeah, uh, so kind of expanding on one we mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you go to the Compliance Center in Microsoft 365, you'll see that we have a data connector section. Uh, up until recently, you only had probably four or five under there where you could see the um, you know, first connectors that we started with, mostly around uh, social media archiving and, and that kind of scenario. And uh, as of yesterday, we announced the global availability of another 20 connectors. Uh, a lot of them in partnership with uh, two great new partners of GlobalNet and Telemessage, where you will be able to leverage their own uh, systems if you were already using them to pipe that information from uh, cell phone providers, from WhatsApp, uh, Zoom uh, messaging, Slack, many others, uh, and be able to bring it in so that you can use all of our great compliance solutions, including e-discovery, uh, communications compliance, et cetera. Great. Uh, question to Matt here. I have an actual e-discovery question here. So I'm a huge fan of PowerShell. Um, I know that I can use it to automate operations today for things like hold creation and case creation and, and normal um, e-discovery. Um, I'm starting to look in the advanced e-discovery areas and I don't actually see a lot of PowerShell options. Um, so how would I uh, accomplish the same thing with advanced e-discovery? Oh, thanks, Kevin. So um, you are correct. There is no uh, PowerShell for advanced e-discovery to do uh, automation. Um, we actually announced uh, this week at Ignite that we are uh, releasing a graph API. Um, and so that's in preview right now where you can go and do things like uh, case creation, hold creation. Um, and we're really going to allow you to round out uh, and basically automate the whole end-to-end -end advanced e-discovery uh, workflow. Fantastic. Um, question here to uh, Elliot. Uh, I've heard that uh, basically with the compliance manager, this uh, within this space itself, this is this is difficult because uh, regulations seem to be changing all the time. Um, I have a difficult time uh, keeping up with this. Uh, I assume compliance manager must have the same uh, difficult time. How do we stay up to date with these changes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Compliance Manager has a built-in update and versioning system, uh, and all of the compliance templates that we make available to customers um, are updated on a regular basis whenever uh, there is new regulatory guidance uh, or whenever we have new solutions or suggestions for addressing your compliance needs. Um, so when that happens, we will push an update to you. Uh, we will inform you of any changes that we are making um, and any impact that that might have on your existing workflow um, and give you the option to either immediately take those changes into your assessment workflow uh, or postpone them until you're done with an audit or some other event that might prevent you from wanting to change your current progress. Fantastic. 
Uh, question over here to Roberto. Um, I have heard that, hold on a second, I missed my screen here. Yeah, so records management here, um, I'm used to how this is working in the past, right? I, the record, my records management people have been doing the same thing for years. Um, we take all of our files and we go through and put it in a particular uh, record spot or a record center uh, like within uh, something like SharePoint 2013. Um, how has the records man have we, I guess, changed our approach for how we should handle records management today? And what's the best way to approach this within Microsoft 365? Yeah, great, great question, Kevin. Uh, absolutely. I think as we as collaboration has evolved in general, We've all realized that the approaches that we used to take with records of centralizing them in only certain locations where we had uh, all of the classification and policies applied, and especially many times we were uh, storing them in completely separate systems that were built for records, really create a, uh, a problem of siloing the information. Now you had another place to be, to be able to maintain and have to make sure that you have e-discovery over it, et cetera. Um, and it really put a lot of burden on information workers. And so what we have evolved our thinking is around really making sure that we have in place records management as much as possible, which means that you will be able to declare records and leverage all the greatness of records management right where your end users are collaborating. So you don't have to uh, move everything into a different location, but you can do that in place. We have already some amazing collaboration capabilities in Microsoft 365, so we want to make sure that you can leverage all of those and also do records there. Now for those uh, scenarios where you still want to centralize, you can still leverage many of the current templates that exist or even the newly announced uh, SharePoint Content Center that is part of the SharePoint Syntax announcement uh, where you can, it, it is built for centralizing that type of content and you can leverage some of the great functionality that has uh, been announced. And so this is an evolution and just like, you know, we used to have in SharePoint some legacy functionality around in place records management, uh, which now we've expanded into the records management solution in Microsoft 365 compliance to go across the suite and not just in SharePoint, but it's the same labels that you would use in Exchange and many other places. Awesome. Uh, Re uh, sorry, uh, Nur, question for you. Uh, Endpoint DLP, I saw this in the keynote recently. This looks pretty dang interesting, although I was still kind of wondering real quick when I looked at this. Um, explain for me how this is different from DLP and uh, Tell me if this actually, is this gonna help other things within um, the Microsoft 365 ecosystem? Is this gonna help my other compliance solutions work better? Yeah, so um, Endpoint DLP is a new product that we are now shipping in public preview. Um, and it's an integrated capability as part of Windows 10 uh, that provide you eventually an, an agentless Endpoint DLP capability. Now, this is very important because um, Today, the traditional endpoint DLP uh, that is deployed on uh, Windows 10 devices um, usually hook the system and lead to listen to the kernel. And eventually, we hear a lot of customers that complain about performance impacted uh, of, uh, and they, with that productivity is impacted. So endpoint DLP, because of its integration with uh, Windows 10, provide you an agentless uh, endpoint DLP capability with minimum performance impact and small footprint on the system. It is uh, connected to everything that we already provide in the uh, compliance uh, center for DLP. This is just another workload eventually. You can configure multiple policies for multiple locations and endpoint DLP is part of them. Um, the, one of the capabilities that you can do is to uh, a, a discover put a sensitive information. This is something that has been done with zero configuration. Once you just onboard the machine, you automatically get this KP, this audit logs into our dashboards in the Activity Explorer. And uh, in addition to that, uh, you can configure policies on specific sensitive information to uh, ensure that uh, you block the relevant egress channels and uh, the data can can be exfiltrated. So if someone would take a file that contain, let's say, 50 credit card numbers, and you would like to upload it to a specific analyst site, or would like to upload it to um, um, 
specific, or let's say to copy to a USB device, then these action activities can be blocked and audited as well. Um, the, this is fully integrated with Microsoft Information Protection, means that it, this can integrate based on um, sensitive, sensitivity labels today. And uh, the onboarding is very seamless. You don't need to pack anything. There is no agent that you need to run. The code is running for every single uh, one of our audience that is running Windows 10 uh, today with uh, 1809 build uh, end up. Uh, so this is now in, uh, uh, in public uh, preview and part of our compliance uh, licenses. And uh, I do recommend to evaluate it. Awesome, fantastic. Uh, question to Elliot here. Uh, very excited about Compliance Manager. Um, my company has a, a, a pretty unique regulation. We'll call it uh, Contoso Compliance. Uh, is there something we can do with Compliance Manager to also track uh, against meeting that compliance regulation? Uh, something that maybe hasn't been uh, put into one of the Compliance uh, Manager templates. Yeah, absolutely. So through the custom assessment and custom template workflow, um, we do allow you to bring your own templates into the system. Um, oftentimes those do represent your own custom regulations that your company has come up with. Um, we often find that those are based on ISO, NIST, or common data protection frameworks that we already offer. Um, so we can help you put that together um, by exporting some of those component parts and allowing you to combine them uh, and re-import into the system. Uh, when you're doing that, you can also take advantage of all of the audit results and recommended actions that we've already provided, uh, in addition to any controls or actions that you want to add on your own. Uh, and then once you have that kind of hybrid template, uh, you put it back into Compliance Manager. Uh, it's scored and counted and tracked uh, just like any other template that we have provided to you. Um, and you can continue to manage your compliance against uh, that custom template uh, alongside all of the other regulations that you're tracking in the product. Great. Uh, and I think we have time for one more question and we'll, we'll still get uh, all these questions done in the chat. Uh, this one's to Roberto. Um, are there any plans to provide additional system controls for, we'll say, regulatory labels um, that help us with clerical errors that could occur? Um, so, as example, changing metadata or undeclaring a record without uh, full auditing? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I was just answering it on the Q&A. Um, you know, today the way that we look at regulatory record labels is that they're really intended for those highly immutable scenarios where we as Microsoft are guaranteeing that that record is exactly the one that you applied. Uh, for this reason, it is an opt-in feature. You have to enable it on your tenant to make sure that, and there's several warnings both for the admin when you create one and for the end user before you apply it. The, about the seriousness of this label. Um, now, if you do want to have that a little bit of flexibility, we do recommend you can use the record label, which uh, as we said earlier, you can remove it as an admin, you can, uh, of the container, you can remove the record label, and all of that is logged into the audit log so you can trace back to who did it when, et cetera. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, we have reached about, uh, the end of our time, although we'll try to stick on a little bit um, and make sure that we address all your questions in the chat. Um, I did want to leave a couple of quick calls to action. Please check out um, our Microsoft 365 Compliance uh, Center and our compliance links. Um, please go take a look at these learning paths, the Insider Risk Learning Path, Information Protection Learning Path, and Discovery uh, Respond Learning Paths are great areas to get a, a start on your compliance journey. and. Definitely, definitely go check out Compliance Manager, went GA very recently. We're super excited about this this week. Um, extra thank you. We've had MVPs on the line here uh, answering many, many of your questions. So thank you very much to Erica Telly, Antonio Mayo, uh, Siggy Yaga, and Albert Hooting. Um, thank you very much for your contributions this week. Um, we've got uh, more Ask the Expert sessions coming up. Uh, Thank you very much, everybody, for attending.